We are now in the beginning of what the United Nations has declared to be the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And this episode of the Rewilding Earth podcast is sponsored by Biohabitats, a company dedicated to protecting and restoring ecosystems. Biohabitats would like you to enjoy a virtual moment along the Pecos River in northern New Mexico's Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Although this river has benefited from previous restoration efforts, some reaches have still been degraded by overuse. But there is good news. The site of a new 3,000 acre park along the river, which is being created to better manage recreation and restore the riverine canyon bottomlands, survived this year's devastating Hermit's Peak and Calf Canyon fire. Even better, thanks to New Mexico State Parks and a planning team that includes biohabitats, ecology is front and center in its new master plan. You're listening to the Rewilding Earth Podcast. The most recent issue of Leaf Litter breathes fire. In Biohabitat's Fall Equinox issue, we meet conservation ecologist and prescribed burn expert for the Nature Conservancy, Deborah Landau. Debra is the Director of Ecological Management at the Maryland, D.C. chapter of Nature Conservancy, where she's worked since 2001. Her work focuses on restoration at more than 30 conservancy preserves across Maryland and D.C. She works with staff and partners to restore natural communities across the state, ensuring they are healthy and resilient in light of an uncertain climate future. Among the many restoration activities Deborah manages are prescribed burns, and she has planned and implemented more than a hundred of them over the course of her career in conservation. So my background really is in uh, ecological restoration. So working on natural areas and trying to bring them on a trajectory towards towards a natural state. You know, we can't really move backwards, but uh, towards a natural state as I think we can get. And again and again, uh, fire just really comes out as the most powerful and effective tool for restoring our natural areas. Okay, well, beavers would like to have a word. (laughs) So hydrology certainly plays an important role. And I think a large component, not entirely by any means, but of the reason that we've uh, we're so far from the the historical cycles that we used to have of fire is we've certainly altered our the hydrology of of lots of our natural areas and um, and that certainly caused some areas uh, to be drier than they should and and not to burn as historically they would have but a lot of people don't really realize how much fire plays a role in shaping wetlands as well as uplands and grasslands and and forested systems. I I often wonder what North America would look like had we developed with fire in mind. I mean, had we made different choices, what would our landscape look like with humans on it, but in a different way? Right. So humans on it, but in a different way is key. Historically, humans have been shaping our landscape with fire for for many thousands of years, 10 or 15,000 years. um, Indigenous people were using fire and they had a very good understanding of how to use fire as a tool. They would use it for hunting. They would use it for clearing land. They would use it for pest control. So they absolutely understood how to manage fire and shape their natural environment to benefit them, to benefit humans using fire as a tool. And what's happened is as after European colonization, uh, when essentially we put a stop to these very frequent fires that were occurring across the landscape, and it's it's these new humans that that arrived some 400 years ago, 
by suppressing that fire that has really resulted in the altered landscapes that we have today and that's led to these catastrophic fires that we're seeing. One of the phrases that caught my eye in your neck of the woods is ecological fire restoration. And it sounds really cool and a heck of a lot deeper, like it could mean a lot more than just manage burn or prescribed burn. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So ecological fire restoration is using the natural process that is fire, which we have removed from the landscape, and bringing it back in a way that allows us to, to bring back the natural communities that evolved with these frequent fires. And it's tricky. In a lot of situations, when we try to reintroduce fire to an area from which fire has been suppressed for decades, if not a century or more, you have to be very careful. We'll call those a first entry burn. The problem is that fuels have been building up for so long that it's no longer a natural fire once you set that fire because there's there's too much fuel, the trees are too close together, the duff has built up to this thick layer that just bringing fire back isn't going to restore your, your landscape. On the contrary, sometimes the trees that we're trying the hardest to protect, for example, on the eastern shore of Maryland, we have these big, beautiful shortleaf pines that are fire adapted. But what happens is when fire is suppressed for a very long time, you build up this thick layer of duff, of leaves, of needles, and that coats the, the top of the, the roots of the trees. And so the tree starts to send in these tiny little feeder roots up into that duff. So if your first entry burn is hot and burns off all of that duff, you're gonna damage those feeder roots and you might actually kill the large mature trees that you're working so hard to protect. So the first time you come in, you have to be really careful. Sometimes we'll make that first entry burn, maybe just a couple of days after rain, and we'll just have a light burn to kind of start to burn off some of that duff, some of that fuel layer. And then the second or third time we'll come in with a little bit more intensity. And that's when we'll really start to open it back up. And that's when we'll really start to see the exciting fire effects. Like once you let in more light to the ground, a lot of the spring ephemerals will show up. Orchids love fire and they'll pop out in areas that we hadn't seen them sometimes in decades after just one or two burns. Some other plants that need disturbance, such as pitcher plants, can come back from areas where they've been extirpated similarly for years and years. Uh, so once you get that, that natural fire regime going, once you've burned off those, that critical fuel layer, then you can really see the transformation. You'll, you'll, you'll kill off some trees. So you'll end up with fewer larger trees with this really amazingly diverse vegetative component between them. You'll get all these grasses and forbs and wildflowers. And that's when you really walk in and just say, wow, look how different this landscape looks. A lot of times, you know, when we'll go for a walk in our backyard or in, in, a, in, in what we think is a natural forested setting, it's kind of dark and closed and there's not a lot of stuff underneath. There's just a whole lot of young trees, but that's not really necessarily what a natural landscape should have looked like. Historically, um, when settlers first arrived, they encountered big trees that are very far apart. They were described forests that you could drive your horse-drawn carriage through. They were so open. And that's kind of the goal that we have in mind when we're bringing fire back to these fire suppressed systems. But it's a slow process and it's a careful process and you can really bungle it up if, you're not, if you go in a little too fast. I think I might've only been in knowingly one area in the United States where fire reigned supreme, unsuppressed for the most part, um, and that was the Gila Wilderness and specifically McKenna Park in the heart of the Gila Wilderness. And I can picture exactly what you're talking about. It was really strange to me growing up in the kind of forest that you described formerly, 
that that was the kind of forest I thought was good, healthy forest that was a little bit choked up from the sunlight, choked off and not a lot of understory. But then I walked and and I luckily had I got to do that with Dave Foreman and Nancy Morton. And I had somebody there to explain it to me. And he talked about this. This is it was Ponderosa pines that were the biggest Ponderosa pines I've ever seen. And they were really, really spaced apart. And he started talking about fire and how that had. So, and I could see uh, uh, burn marks on bark all throughout the wilderness. And um, we saw recent burns um, and they are in wilderness. So they were allowed to to burn pretty much undisturbed. And, and when you described that, that's exactly what I pictured. Yes. So you you absolutely nailed it. That's the landscape that we feel historically the indigenous people had shaped with fire. And yet those continuous, never-ending ponderosa pines that we expect to see, say, when we go to a national park, is not a natural situation. We shouldn't have just an endless line of trees up next to each other um, with nothing in between them. It should be groves of large, beautiful pines with open grassland in between them. So that if you envision now a fire sweeping through a diverse mosaic of trees and grasses, then you can see how, you know, you have that light fire as, as it races across the grasses and then it It'll slowly push through the trees and then race again as it goes back into the open grasses. And that is really the landscape that historically we had. And that's why, you know, we had more megafauna, we had more diversity, we had more grasslands. We had so many more grasslands than we do today. And, and it's bringing back that mosaic that's key. You, you know, our forests were not homogenous. Uh, they were very diverse. We had that. We had the wetlands. We had the grasslands. We had the forests all intermixed. And by removing fire from these natural areas, we've just created these very homogeneous situations uh, that are not natural and unfortunately are almost literally tinder boxes. Well, that's what I wanted to go to next. There's another place in New Mexico where I. Uh worked uh, frequently in uh, Santa Fe in the Sangre de Cristos and one of the biggest Aspen organism. <laughs> All And anybody who's been to Santa Fe, especially in the fall, has seen the Aspens turn bright yellow and it's the whole face. Anybody who's seen pictures of Santa Fe, that's one of the photographer's best pictures you can take of Santa Fe. You get an adobe in the foreground and then the background of the and, and what we were talking about in the 90s is that the fire suppression had built up so much to the point of the 90s. I don't know what's happened since then. I haven't heard of any fires, but people were calling it that, a tinderbox. Some people talked about a point of no return, that it, the only fire that could be there uh, after a certain point could only be a disaster. Has Have we cracked the code at, at doing something positive and good in those situations or is the only result after so much buildup has occurred a disaster yeah that's a really tricky question i'm an optimist at heart and i'd like to think that we're heading in the right direction we are heading in the right direction every day every year there's a better understanding of the importance of control burns and bringing fire back to the landscape but every day, every year, we're falling further and further behind. And it's so difficult to really effectively get fire back on the landscape at scale. And as many incredibly successful control burns as are occurring every single day, you'll get one that escapes and that's the one that makes the headlines. And that's very frustrating for fire practitioners. But we, you know, there is hope. <laughs> we are increasingly learning how to get large scale fire back on the ground. Um, historically, we would kind of create a box. We would come in maybe with bulldozers and scratch in a fire line around the area that we wanted to burn. And then that would be the area that we would burn. And that took a lot of energy and it was fairly disruptive to the landscape. 
But now there's a much better understanding that you can use natural barriers, you can use a river, you can use an existing road and burning larger areas at using these natural, what historically would have been your, your fire breaks. And that's working really well, but I don't really know that how we'll be able to really get back to, to gain a hundred years of lost fire. That, that's a huge challenge. And when we are having these mega fires that, that are making the headlines, they're not natural fires because those trees are so close together and the fuels have built up for so long. When those fires do occur, they're completely consuming the tree and they're just jumping from tree to tree. And they're so hot that they can actually sterilize the soil. So it can take these systems a really long time to recover, as opposed to an area that has had frequent regular burns where the fuels are sparser, so the fire intensity is much lower, you still have your healthy soil microorganisms. You've got your micro mycorrhizal fungi in there. You've got your seed bank. So in those situations, after a burn, you get this amazing resurgence of green and of growth and diversity. So it's gonna take a lot of work to get back, to get these systems back to where they should be with fewer fuels, with more spaced out trees, with more of that grass component. At the same time, you know, we've got the added stressor of climate change. We've got longer mm -hmm. periods of drought. We've got warmer temperatures. And that's certainly exacerbating the challenge of, of bringing fire back to the landscape at scale. It's certainly the case that we used to have intense fires, absolutely. And there's systems, when I say that most of North America is fire adapted, that can be from as frequent as the longleaf pine savannas in the Southeast, which would burn every one, two or three years, to boreal forests that maybe historically would have burned every thousand years. Everything has a fire cycle. And it's just a matter of, ensuring that those cycles are met. And if if they're artificially suppressed, that's when you're really gonna start to bungle things. <laughs> and you'll really start to see these, these unnatural, unnaturally intense and hot and destructive fires that we're witnessing today. You're listening to the Rewilding Earth Podcast. From humble beginnings to global conservation phenomenon, the rewilding movement continues to grow and thrive amid the greatest ecological challenges our planet has faced in 65 million years. Here's how you can join us and help return balance to nature. First, go to rewilding.org and subscribe to the Weekly Digest to keep up on the latest rewilding news, interviews, and art. Second, consider donating to support the Rewilding Institute's mission to rewild North America and beyond. And for extra credit, please like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help spread the word. Thanks so much for your support. When these things happen, the really bad burns, and there's loss of property and sometimes human lives, people start talking about Smokey the Bear type stuff. Like they're not talking about fire is natural. And if we would have let the natural fire regime go through these areas, we probably wouldn't have built here, but we certainly wouldn't have probably also had this huge, intense, hot fire. That's not the conversation that's happening after these burns. It is a different conversation happening behind the scenes with public officials who know a little bit more and are exposed to people like you more often and understand things and how do they balance that public pressure to say no more fires anywhere ever uh, versus what you say? Yeah, that gets really tricky when you start to talk about humans, because what we call the wildland urban interface is when people move into these areas that historically would have had regular fires. So what's happening is, yes, on one side, we're trying to increase control burns across the landscape. But at the same time, as people want to, you know, move into nature, they're building their homes right in these areas, which, again, to them look beautiful and pristine because you just see this continuous swath of forest without really understanding the true nature 
of that natural area and that historically it shouldn't look like that. And by having this continuous swath of trees, you're just moving into a really dangerous area. And we really can't stop people from buying land and moving where they want to. But that's increasingly going to be an issue as we try to get more fire on the ground and we try to restore these areas and make them safer. There has been a lot of improvement in getting the word out to people when they do build these homes in the forest on making their houses fire safe. So making sure that there's an area with low vegetation around their house, making sure that their roof say make it of metal instead of asphalt shingles make sure that there's not a thick layer of pine needles on it there are things you can certainly do to protect your home if you are living in a fire prone area but there's it's very difficult as as more and more people are moving into these areas to safely protect them and and safety is key because the more people that move into the, these areas the more we're going to put our firefighters at risk as they move in to protect the structures where folks have 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 moved into so it's a real tricky situation and another problem with these wildland urban interfaces is um so a lot of times people ask me about carbon emissions with fires and well when we're doing these control burns goodness isn't that a bad thing because you're releasing all this carbon into the atmosphere and what i tell them is well when when we're burning on purpose when we're doing a control burn it's it really is under very controlled circumstances it's not too hot it's not too windy it's not too dry we're burning in a very targeted area and the result of those burns is this amazing resurgence in growth. So you, even though you've released some carbon to the atmosphere, you're locking in so much more with the new growth that you get after the burn. And there's a lot of the fuels that don't get completely consumed. They turn into, say, charcoal or pyrogenic carbon. And those actually get locked into the soil for millennia. But these mega fires that we're seeing are so hot that they're even burning the soil. So the entire tree is consumed, the soil is burned, and it takes very, very long for those systems to recover and to recover that carbon that was lost. But when you compound that with houses and cars and petroleum products, when you're burning all of that, the effects are really catastrophic. So it's just a whole other order of magnitude of damage that's occurring now with these uh, these mega fires out west and this combination of, um, of forests with far too much fuel in them and, and human structures. I was reading the lead up in your interview in the latest issue of Biohabitat's Leaf Litter, and uh, I noticed well, you'd obviously be someone to listen to on this topic as you've managed over a hundred prescribed burns. So I wonder what you have seen that people would be really surprised about. What did you notice that your training and your experience up to that time never really prepared you for in terms of results or activities during a burn um, that, you know, kind of was exposed to you by nature? Uh, and the, by the nature of fire. I could go on all day about the things that excite me during a burn and from the effect <laughs> of burning. I really, it just, it's what, it, it, it's what drives me. So one of the first things that you see after a burn is that amazing green that, that comes up so quickly. You know, after, during a burn, you get this nitrogen pulse into the ground. And then the, the ground is physically darker. So you get more radiant light and you're warming up the ground. So the the resurgence of, of vegetation after a burn is just amazing. It's a green like you've never seen a green before. But then when you get the the flowers, the orchids, the the trilliums that come in after a burn, it's just so gratifying to know that you're you're doing something right. The, the organisms respond so quickly. 
But at the same time, the other animals, we've had incredible results with rare insects. Like there's a rare tiger beetle in one of the areas that we were burning. And it has just absolutely increased, not only in numbers, but in spread. It's really increased the area that's accessible to it because we've opened it up with fire. And the birds that have come back, we've had this amazing population of red-headed woodpeckers that entered one of the areas that we've been burning regularly, and they're just going bonkers. The bat population has increased. You know, when you're burning, you're opening it up. You're making it easier for predators, such as birds and bats, to, to have sight lines to fly through a forest and to hunt effectively. Another thing that's really surprised me is wetland burning, you would be amazed by how fire can carry across a wetland with water or with wet sphagnum moss. Some of these wetland plants are so fire adapted that even if the wetland still has some moisture in it, the fire will still burn across that vegetation and open it up and you'll still get the positive regenerating effects, the benefits from the fire, even in a wet area. It's just really astounding how so many of these systems have evolved, uh, not just to require fire, but to help the fire move along, like to encourage the fire. I can tell I hit a, I hit a good nerve there. <laughs> we found the sweet spot here. And I wanted to draw up, I wanted you to draw a picture of what it was like, what we're actually talking about, because we get awfully academic about this at times. And uh, in the conservation community, we feel that's enough to make an impact and to get a point across to lay people about this. And all we're really talking about sometimes is fire good, you know, and that's it. And I wanted this picture. I knew this picture existed. And it, it leads me to another thing that I often worry about when I see a fire, whether it's a good or a bad fire. And that's the carbon that's released by the fire itself that had been stored. And I and when you describe the vegetative recovery of an area, I start to think, well, how much of the burn carbon release is is taken back up by all that new growth. Has anyone done work in that area to try to quantify such a thing? There are studies looking at that, but not quite enough. And fortunately they're increasing and more people are looking at that. But absolutely, there is so much more carbon that is locked into an area that has burned, I'll call it naturally, that has burned, that has been burning regularly so that you don't have an unnatural, a naturally heavy fuel load. Those areas, once they've experienced the burn, the amount of regrowth that you see is just tremendous. Uh, and again, there, there are studies looking at trees. Large mature trees will grow larger faster after a burn and certainly the herbaceous vegetation. But that pyrogenic carbon, the unburned, the, the, the parts of the fuels that have not completely burned, that charcoal that then works itself back into the soil there is so much about that that we don't understand. First off, yes, that's an enormous amount of carbon that's being locked into the system for millennia. And that carbon plays a role. It plays a role with, with filtering water, even with retaining water. It plays a role interacting with the nutrients and the plants. And there's so much that we don't even realize is happening by suppressing fire, we're no longer regularly introducing this pyrogenic carbon into the soil throughout the landscape. And, and who knows how much negative effects that we're having on the landscape, not just above by causing these mega fires because of all the fuel buildup, but below as well. We have a very poor understanding of how the microorganisms relied on the fire, how all these different systems, these different ecological systems were interacting when we had these regular fires. It's a lot like the discussion I've had with Keith at Biohabitats as well, in terms of what we humans just don't know and how, how everyone at Biohabitats and Nature Conservancy and other places are really learning on the job all the time. 
you know, every burn must be an educational experience because there's, there's so many different variables every time you do it. We we have to step back at some point and say, that's that's it, nature. You got to take it from here. We don't understand exactly what you do next. You're absolutely right. That is right on. And that's part of the excitement and the joy in, in ecological restoration is when you restore these systems so much of it kind of takes over. It's almost like it's just waiting for you to bring that fire back and we'll take it from here. Again, there's areas that we've burned and been so surprised by the orchids that have come back by the pitcher plants that have reemerged after decades. It's just waiting for those processes to return. And we'll really never truly understand what is happening, whether it's that heat pulse, the nitrogen flush, the chemical reaction from the smoke, the carbon, who knows what's going on. And maybe one day we'll have a better understanding of it. But what we know is when we bring fire back to the landscape in a careful way, the results are really astoundingly positive. I imagine there's not enough people doing the kind of work that you do. And if there's not, what would you recommend to people who are listening to this and maybe thinking, hey, I might want to add something to my major or I'm going into school. I might want to look at this a little. What would people do to prepare themselves to I'm sure you have to have a license and things like that and and certain kinds of training, of course. What What's that training look like? What should people prepare for if they want to do what you do? Yeah, so I would strongly encourage anybody who's interested in the ecological world to tap into fire ecology. I really, truly, obviously, I love it. But I think increasingly, as people understand the importance of bringing fire back to our natural areas, it'll be more and more recognized as an important field for people to work in. In order to be certified to burn, it's it's not too complicated if you just wanna help on a fire line. You have to take a class, it's about a week, and you have to pass a physical fitness test to, to show that you can, you can hang in there. Um, but otherwise, it doesn't take too much to be able to participate in a burn. And, and most of our forest service, our state forest service agencies offer that class for free. But if you want to move up to be a crew boss or an engine boss or a burn boss, that takes many, many years of training and experience. It's so important to really have the experience that it takes to understand fire and fire behavior and the effects that weather has on fire. And, and to be prepared for the unexpected, because when you're working with fire, you always kind of have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Uh, but safety is always first. So we're extremely careful when we're looking at planning a burn and making sure that the weather parameters are exactly as we want. We literally write a prescription. We write a plan that says exactly how we think it's gonna go. And the humidity has to be just so, the wind just so, from just this direction. And sometimes when everybody hurries up and drives and shows up to the burn, we'll literally sit around for an hour just waiting for that humidity to be exactly what we need to proceed with the burn. So it's your classic hurry up and wait. <laughs> mm. um, but the the patience and and putting safety first really do pay off in the end. The Nature Conservancy has been burning since 1962, so we're actually celebrating our 60th anniversary this year, which is really exciting. So we do a lot of burning, and we do have a lot of wonderful volunteers who help us participate in the burns. And yeah, as long as they've gone through that training, which again is usually through the Forest Service, but TNC also provides training often, and as long as they recertify with what we call a PAC test, this physical fitness test, and, and they go through what we call a refresher training every year to make sure you're up to date on all of your credentials, then we're very happy to have you join our burn. And, you know, some people will come once and just say, nope, not for me. And others, boy, they get the bug and they just can't get enough of it. 
You know, there, there's a thrill in, in seeing this natural process that historically would have occurred all the time and to really witness it. And when I talk about being on a burn, I'm absolutely not talking about these huge flame lengths and this, this scary situation. Most of the burns that we consider most successful are kind of boring. It's just low flame length, maybe two or three feet high, just slowly moving through a forest, consuming those fuels. And that really is all it takes to restore some of these natural areas. But if you've got the bug, come on and join us. <laughs> so another T-shirt slogan is born. A good fire is a boring fire. <laughs> there you go. I'm not sure how well the sales will go on that one. <laughs> I'd buy that T-shirt, but I'm weird. <laughs> well, Deborah, thank you so much. What can, what can people do to learn more about this? Yeah, great question. So I would go to nature.org and enter good fire into the search and you'll get all sorts of really interesting information on fire ecology and fire history and the work we're doing to restore our natural areas. Deborah, thanks so much for being on the Rewilding Earth podcast. Thanks so much for covering this topic. I'm so excited to talk about it with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Rewilding Earth podcast. We do what we do because of you. This podcast is supported by listeners like you who long to live in a wilder world. Please consider donating at rewilding.org and subscribe to our weekly news and article digest while you're there. To go the extra mile, you can follow and share Rewilding Earth on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Bonus points for sharing this podcast with your friends. To listen to past episodes, go to rewilding.org pod. That's rewilding.org pod.